Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled How to Translate Complex Genomic Data to Clinically Oriented Personalized Cancer Care, a Real-World Experience. This webinar is a part of the 13th Annual Clinical Diagnostics and Research Virtual Event. I am Antonina Salcido of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Kyogen. For more information about Kyogen, please go to kyogen.com. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to first participate by communicating with other attendees using our new live chat feature during the presentation. You can find the live chat located at the left of your screen. You can also participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Submit. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Help Desk button located at the top of your screen with the navigation bar or from the lobby. Finally, as a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credits link located in the Abstract tab from the menu at the left of your screen and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Anna Kravochika, Head of Department for Genetic Counseling and Institute of Radiology and Oncology in Serbia. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Presenter tab from the menu at the left of your screen. Dr. Kravochka, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome to our webcast on how to translate complex genomic data to clinically oriented personalized cancer care, a real world experience, which will be presented to you by Dr. Anna Kravochka. It is an honor to have you all with us today. First, a quick legal disclaimer. I'd like to point out that the Kyogen products shown here are intended for molecular biology applications. These products are not intended for the diagnosis, prevention, or treatment of a disease. If you would like additional information, please see the respective Kaijin Kit Handbook or user manual. Now, before you start the presentation, I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker. Dr. Anna Kravochika is the founder and head of the Department for Genetic Counseling at the Institute for Oncology and Radiology of Serbia. She completed her PhD studies in genetics from the School of Biology at the University of Belgrade. Her research is focused mostly on genetics and molecular biomarkers in breast and ovarian cancers. Thank you for joining us today, Anna. I'll now hand the presentation over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm going to speak about uh, how to translate complex genomic data, and uh, I'm going to give you our experience from Institute for Oncology and Radiology of Serbia. So here are my, my disclosures. And this is our today's webinar. So it's going to be a short introduction of the place where I currently work. And I'm going to uh, show to you how we perform manual data curation and how we do report generation with some real world experience uh, examples in hereditary cancer genetic testing from our lab. Then I'm going to compare manual versus computational variant classification with these examples to show you how QCI interprets can be used for automated variant annotation and uh, the ways we use it. And I'm going to finish up with the QCI interpret benefits and how did we benefit by using this particular software. So to start off, this is, this is the place where, where I currently work. So it is Institute for Oncology and Radiology of Serbia. It is also National Cancer Research Center. So we are situated in Belgrade, its capital of Serbia. And this is a large actually clinical center, it's a governmental institution. And uh, besides all the clinic, clinical departments that you see, they're primarily focused on diagnosing and treating cancer patients. We also have a research department with a lot of uh, PhD and uh, PhD level scientists and PhD students. But today I'm going to speak about our work in molecular diagnostics department, where we get referrals from all over the Serbia and surrounding countries for molecular genetic testing. And since, since we are going to speak about sequencing, 
uh, we started sequencing in 2008 and it was a long time ago. We performed Sanger sequencing. We did it only for BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes in hereditary breast and ovarian cancers. And it was slow, it was inefficient, demanding, as all of you know, who performed Sanger sequencing. And as uh, uh, slow and inefficient, it couldn't be implemented into our uh, routine diagnostics. So we performed it only through the research projects. Since 2016, we started performing NGS. We were equipped with one Illumina MySeq machine. We continued working in hereditary cancer genetics. We also included somatic panels and we become more uh, efficient, faster. And these tests are now part of our routine clinical practice and most of them are covered by insurance. And since 2016, I think we've come a long way. We started again with BRCA1 and BRCA2 only with NGS. Uh, a year later, we introduced a smaller gene panel for high-risk breast cancer genes. We ended up, but we're still improving, performing Illumina through site cancer panel, but uh, I think we are going to um, switch to another, but for now, this is the one. And actually now we are able to offer our patients not just tests for hereditary breast cancers with which we started, we are able to offer a panel and customized panel for different hereditary cancers. Uh, for those that are not covered by insurance, uh, our patients are able to pay out of the pocket. And uh, how do we do our main data curation? How did we do it? And how do we do it now with, with the software? Uh, for all of you who performed NGS, you know that besides technical limitations that you have issues issues with protocols, with the machine, with the throughput of the machine, all of us have the same issue and the same difficulties and the same challenges when we face interpreting the clinical significance of DNA variations detected by this technology. So uh, with a lot of new genes, with a lot of new panels, for each patient, we sometimes have to classify up to a couple of hundreds variants in our panels, which is really difficult. It's, it is a daunting task. And we have to assess all the information that we can about that particular variant to assign the clinical significance to the variant. And these data sources that are, also, that are provided, uh, they have sometimes information that are dispersed. So sometimes it's difficult to find proper information and write information. These databases are heterogeneous. They quickly evolve and they're sometimes conflicting, which makes this, uh, process even more difficult. And with the NGS, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's really complicated. Usually it's easy when you see a nonsense or a frame shift mutation in a cancer susceptibility gene. So you basically know based on the biological function of this particular mutation that is probably going to have clinical significance. However, when you find a missense mutation, particularly those that are synonymous, uh, that are non-synonymous, sorry, uh, these are sometimes difficult to assess. And what do we do? As most of us do, we uh, classify variants according to ACMG and the MP guidelines from 2015, from class one being benign to class five being pathogenic. And we do not include these class one and class two in our reports, but all other classes we uh, interpret and include in our reports, clinical reports. And this is our pipeline uh, when we perform manual variant annotation. So we tend to keep our local database updated. So when you have a good local database of genetic variations that you detect with your NGS pipeline, uh, it's easier. Every time you see the variant that you already annotated, you don't have to do it all over again. Uh, if you see it for the first time, we manually look through public mutation databases that can be variation, locus, or gene-specific. We perform literature search. We look at the segregation studies and functional studies in silico data, finally, to get the final uh, pathogenicity class. And after that, we put the annotation in our local database. And again, it's easy when you see it all over again in your next patient. And this is the actually uh, printout of ACMG criteria for, for classifying genetic variants. So we look for each and every variant into all of these of 28, I think, criteria and evidence for classification of uh, pathogenicity or of variant being benign. And then we go 
to the rule classification table, table we combine the evidence that we found and then assign one of the classes to our variant. And this is more, more or less pipeline that I believe all of us perform when you do manual annotation, no matter uh, where you work and where uh, are you situated. And I think the best way to show how the pipeline and how the process work is by showing a couple of examples. So I wanted to start with, with an easy classification and to show you how QCI interpret can help you to facilitate the whole process. So this was a BRCA1 that we detected a couple of years ago in our, in our institution. And it was a missense, non-synonymous variation. And why do I say that it's easy? It's easy because you have enough data. It takes a lot of time to do manual annotation. But the thing that makes things easier is to find enough information that are reliable to classify your variants. So here for this particular variant, we went through all of these databases and we found enough evidence for classification. And we went to the rule classification table and assigned the likely pathogenic status for this particular variant. And for this particular variant, we found two strong evidence of pathogenicity, two moderate and one supporting, and none evidence favoring polymorphism. And this was an easy one because we found enough information, we found enough evidence, and we classified it, let's say, more or less easy. But take a moment to think about how much time do you need to look into the all of these databases that I showed you. If you do it manually, uh, uh, annotation of when one variant can take up to three hours, even if you are an experienced curator. Then think about the number of variants per patient or per panel that you perform for a smaller or a larger panel that you have to do every day. It can be up to a couple of hundreds for one patient. Then you can easily calculate how many hours do you need to annotate each and every variant, even if it's easy, for one patient. It, of course, depends on your local database, but it will take days. So even when it's easy, we wanted to find a solution that is going to help us to uh, make this process quicker, faster, easier for all of, of people who work in the lab. So we wanted to do it with a QCI interpret. And how does it look like? So for manual annotation, you have to perform annotation for each variant that you detect independently. Here in the software, you upload your VCF from the patient, from the VCF file from the patient, and you immediately see in the software the list of variants that are detected in your sample. So these variants are I think sorted alphabetically, but first of all, you see the color codes and the software will give you the pathogenicity status in colors. And it is going to give you uh, on top of the list, those that are clinically actionable, that are clinically important. For this particular patient, this was the BRCA1 that I showed you. And here on your right, you can actually filter the variants according to your needs so you can choose to see only pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants, or maybe you want to reevaluate the USs. No matter what you want to do, everything is right in front of you. So you have the whole VCF file uploaded and you have all the variants, all the variants listed. If you want to take a look at this particular variant, you just click on it and you have the variant details tab above and you see all the information that, that um, software used to perform this classification. So this was pathogenic according to software. And we have the criteria that, the, uh, that was assigned by the knowledge base and used for this particular classification. You also have enough variant detail, details that you can assess. You have the uh, position of the mutation in the gene, the effect of the protein. You have reported, reported clinical cases of the particular phenotype that you are interested in. You also have uh, population frequency, which is really important for classification in terms of hereditary cancers. You also have all in silico data related to this particular variant right in front of you and a genomic viewer. I always like to see where, uh, where is it situated in the genome. So, uh, 
the thing that you see here is that software gives you all the evidence that you don't, do not have to manually look for, and it gives you it in just a couple of minutes. And of course, there is the bibliography, so you can go and manually see each and every uh, data and every information from the literature that you want to reevaluate and assign to your bank. So here I wanted to point out that QCI can be used uh, as a solution for fast automated annotation of all detected variants in your sample. Unlike the databases and manual annotation that you have to do it individually, here you upload your sample and that's it. It's easy, it's user-friendly, and it gives you evidence for variant annotation that are clearly, clearly presented and you can go over them and just decide whether you want to include them in report or not. In terms of time, even when it's easy, it's fast. It's fast upload, it's fast analysis, just a couple of minutes. It's fast report generation. And from file to the final report, you just get in a few minutes. You remember that I told you that you need up to three hours to annotate just one variant memory. And the thing I think it's really important is that this software is reliable because in the backbone, there is a huge knowledge base and comprehensive knowledge base, which was which is expert, expertly created, and it has up-to-date content, which is really important. And they have a lot of PhD and MD level scientists doing curation for you, and more than three million patient cases that are interpreted by this particular software. And this was an easy, an easy example. I'm going to show you a couple of difficult examples. When it's not that easy, the first one is BRCA2. Uh, when there was a lack of evidence in the literature for proper classification, it was a slice site condition. And if you assign only one evidence that you could find and that was available online, you would probably misclassify this solution because if you assign only one evidence that you were able to find, it's actually class three, which is variant of unknown clinical significance. But if you have a software that is going to give you more information and more evidence that you were not able to find for any reason, for whatever reason, you are going to classify it properly as class four. So it is really important to, to use reliable software for classification for the variants that actually are not well described in the literature. Because if you decide to classify it as BUS, these are not clinically actionable and you might make serious mistake can cause serious harm to the patient. And if you decide it's likely pathogenic, it is clinically actionable. And this patient is actually, um, actually uh, eligible for targeted treatment. Another difficult uh, variant is when you have enough evidence, but you find them conflicting. This is particularly uh, for CHECK2, the example for CHECK2, again, distance mutation where you go through all the databases and you have a lot of information, but you are not sure whether you should uh, assign class, it to a class three or class four, which is a huge difference. So you are not sure which criteria and which evidence to use to, um, uh, to finalize classification. So if you decide not to use one of the evidence, which you might find not well, uh, not well suitable for this particular variant. It can make a huge difference and it can go from uh, not actionable to actionable classification. And I wanted to see how to use QCI in this particular example when I had a check due, which I did not know how to uh, annotate. So I uploaded the VCF file and it immediately gave me the list of variants and check to on front on top. Uh, with the status of uh, variant being pathogenic. And here in the software, you can also see classification explanation. As I told you before, all the evidence that are, that are used here for this particular classification. And if you have some conflicting criteria, the software is going to give you a small yellow flag for you to review it. But again, it's easier because you're sure that you have all the evidence in front of you. Another difficult example that we had a couple of years ago was actually a synonymous mutation, which we thought it could be likely pathogenic, but we were not sure. It was in PALP2, and it was a synonymous mutation. 
we had a lot of evidence, but again, conflicting. And what did we do? We struggled a lot, especially since this mutation was found in male breast cancer patients coming from breast and pancreatic cancer family, which is actually completely related to pulp 2 uh, hereditary cancer, related hereditary cancers. And to make things worse, this particular patient had three daughters, uh, all of which uh, were in uh, uh, ages where the counseling and testing would be appropriate if this was the likely pathogenic variant. And back then, I know we had a lot of difficulties. We asked from, for help from different colleagues from other countries. We classif classify it as likely pathogenic. But then I wanted to do it retrospectively in QCI. I wanted to see what uh, does QCI tell about this particular variant, and immediately it says it's pathogenic, with new evidence actually that appeared in, in last couple of years, with all the information that I needed to actually classify it as pathogenic myself. And I was really proud to see that our publication from our group, from our institution that we included uh, back then, when we had difficulties in annotation, was published and was listed here in the list of bibliography cases as the most recent one that supports this classification. So here, I want to add that you can use QCI for difficult annotations, no matter whether you do not find evidence or it's difficult to find evidence, and if you have uh, um, evidence that is conflicting, it's easier because uh, software gives you everything. So it's up to you, of course, at the end to decide, but it's easier because it, everything is right in front of you. And of course, you have links to other databases for manual inspection. What, what I think that is really important, especially in the days when we have a lot of genes in large gene panels that we perform, we often find the US and we do perform the US reclassification uh, once or twice a year. Now with the software, we do it more often. So this was example of BRCA1 uh, misinspiration that we detected in 2019. Again, really difficult annotation, but back then we didn't have enough information to classify it as likely pathogenic. We ended up with VUS classification. Although I was really worried about this one because as you see from the pedigree, it is a really uh, BRCA1 uh, related uh, family history and something that is simply lo uh, is looking like likely pathogenic BRCA1, but back then we didn't have enough. So I did reclassification in the QCI. So I put this particular BCF file into the software. And of course, in 2022, we had new evidence. And now I was able, just a couple of months ago, to able to reclassify this particular variant and to issue a new report, a new result. And now this patient is considered BRCA1 positive. And of course, I uh, checked into all uh, bibliography cases and so clinical cases which uh, showed me enough evidence for classification. So here to add, uh, you can use this software for regular VUS reclassification. So you can do it more often because it's easy. You have expert curated and up-to-date content and all novel evidence that you can use for VUS reclassification. And last but not the least, uh, the reporting is really easy. You have a tab where you can review and report your variants, you just click on it after you checked all, all the variants that you want to include into, into your report, and you have a report in just a couple of, let's say, seconds. And sort of to take home messages, I wanted to show you that you can use QCI interpret for, for many things. First of all, it is fast and reliable. It is a system that is suitable for larger panels. And even for, for, for smaller panels, when it seems easy, as I told you, time in clinical labs is essential. So it's suitable for all clinical labs. It's, again, reliable software for difficult annotations. When you're not able to find enough evidence online, it gives you everything. It's really useful for VUS reclassifications. Now, when we have QCI interpret, we do it more often, which is really important for the patients, and we update our results based on the new evidence. Uh, for clinicians and clinical labs, it, impor it is important to be easy and uh, quick processes to final clinical reports. So you get everything in just a couple of 
minutes, and it's user friendly and clinically oriented. And for the end, I just want to thank you for listening to this to this talk and to show you a couple of our publications. We still publish a lot, so you can take a look online. And again, thank you for your attention. Thank you for that great presentation, Anna. So we've received a few questions, um, so we'll take our remaining time to go over them. The first question that we've received is, what are the most important features that a software for variant interpretation should have? And also does QCI interpret cover these? Yes, uh, I think that the softwares um, should have a lot of features that are really important to uh, clinical laboratory geneticists particularly and then for clinicians as well but with the market and the, uh, with, with all the softwares and the databases that we have i think that the reliability is something that is really important so no matter what you choose it's important that you believe in the system so you have to be aware of the system flaws in general, not just in terms of softwares. So we are still upgrading the knowledge in genetics and everything, but you need to have a reliable system which is updated. So you need new evidence, you need a knowledge base, you need the curation, which is reliable. And I think that is the most important feature. Everything else is manageable. If it's slower, if it's faster, if it's, fa it's going to be faster than you, for sure. <laughs> so I think reliability, and I, I believe that QCI interpret and the Kyogen uh, is a re really reliable system because of their huge knowledge base that they have, uh, because of the clinical cases that they present, because of the more than 3 million, I think, uh, variants explained. And I think it's really transparent. So I think that is important as well. So you can manually review all the evidence. So um, I believe the QCI interpret has, has it all for, for the clinical labs, especially. Great. Thank you. The next question we have is, can we customize the final report and QCI interpret? Yeah, I have to admit that uh, we do not use this feature because the report is in English, but uh, we uh, I, I saw how it works and it's really easy and you can customize it. So first of all, you take a look at the variant lists and you decide which ones you want to include in the report or not. So if you don't want to include BUS is if you have a management of US policies that uh, do not want that do not need BUS to be included, you can just exclude them from the report. Uh, and uh, I think I'm I'm not sure, but I think that you can also uh, customize the report in terms of your own lab logo and so on and so forth. So it's easy. We do not use it, but I think it's it's easy for those who 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 use it in English. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next question is, which kind of labs would benefit the most from using QCI Interpret? All clinical labs. <laughs> if, you, if you are a smaller clinical lab, it depends on what you do. If you perform targeted sequencing for whatever reason, you do not need the software for annotation. Even if you have one gene or two genes, but if you perform NGS, it's more likely that you are going to have a gene panel. If you ask me, if you have a gene panel of let's say five to 10 gene, genes use software, because when we started with BRCA1 and BRCA2, uh, we usually find 10 to 15 variants in both gene per patient. So you have 15 variants in two genes. So it's a lot of time. If you have, uh, the funding, of course, choose software for whatever panel that you use. And if you're a clinical lab, I think uh, it's this software is really suitable for you because it's clinically oriented. It gives you reports from clinical cases, which is really important for clinical oncologists. And if you are a research lab, then I'm not sure whether QCI Interpret is the right choice because you do not need all the features that this software offers you. But if you are a clinical lab, no matter whether you are smaller or larger, and if you have the funding, choose the software for all kinds of variants, even for two genes. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. 
So the last question uh, we're going to take now is, what if I have a couple of files for the same patient? Can I upload and analyze them all together, or do I have to do it separately? You don't have to do it separately. You can, uh, I believe, you, you, they just need to have the same thing. But the software is going to recognize it and just put it all in front of you. So when you see the output, it's going to be like you have the one, one file. So if you have, let's say, CNV file and the SNV file, you just give it the same name and just upload them into the software. And the software is going to give you the list of all variants, no matter from which file they are. They are. Uh, it's important that they are from the same patient, but you are going to know that when you upload it. So you don't have to do it manually. You don't have to do it separately. You can do it all over. Um, you can do it all together. And you don't have to manually look to the, to the to every variant, the software gives you the list already annotated. You, you can just filter out the variants that you want to look further into, and that's it. You don't have to look at any. <laughs> you don't have to look at any. You can just proceed to the report generation, but uh, I usually do. I take a look at the evidence for these tricky variants and for those that are going to be included into report. I just take a look at it, if nothing else, but sometimes I uh, devote more time to look at the evidence and to decide whether it's going to be reportable or not. Anna, thank you again for your presentation today. And with that, I will conclude today's webcast. And I want to thank the audience for your attention. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kravochika, for your time today and your important research. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Kyogen, for sponsoring today's webinar. Questions submitted today and during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand for two years until November 9th, 2024. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share that email with any one of your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.